today, which is the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. <laughs> Chaz Palmateri. Chaz, Hi. thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're in town, a yeah. Bronx Tales in town. Yes. This thing has taken on a life of its own. You wrote this as yeah. a one-man show. Yes. Went to a movie, went back to the stage to add music. Give me an idea on how all that played out. Well, you know, I wrote it uh, 30 years ago, in fact. I did the one-man show. It was, the, it was the thing that really broke me. There was a huge hit in L.A. and New York, the one-man show. And then uh, Robert De Niro came to see it. Of course, everybody wanted it, but they didn't want me. They wanted to put a star in the role. And I got offered 250000 I remember the first time I did the one-man show, and I said no because they didn't want to guarantee me to play the part and write it. It's about my life. I wanted to write it. Yeah. And then it went to 500000 then it went to a million dollars, and I turned it down. I had 200 bucks in the bank. <laughs> And then one day, Robert De Niro walked into the, like two weeks after I turned down the million dollars, Robert De Niro walked into the theater, saw the show. I met him after the show, and he said, wow, that's the greatest one-man show I ever saw. I never seen anything like that. He goes, that's a movie. You did a movie. And I said, yeah. He goes, look, I know what's going on. And he goes, you should play Sonny. You'll be great. You should, you should uh, write it. It's your life. I'll play your father. I'll direct it, and we'll go partners. And that's how it happened. What was it like growing up in the Bronx like that? I mean, your story is yeah. one that continues to fascinate audiences all these years later. I know, 30 years later. It's amazing. You know, when, it's the first time it's ever been done where a person, it went from a one-man show to a movie to a musical. Uh, it's because the story is such an uplifting story. It's about the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. And that's why I encourage families to bring their kids 11 and up, 12 years old, because it's a cautionary tale. Yeah. It makes them see that the choices you make will shape your life forever. And I have so many people who come to see it and say, you know, Chaz, my son was on drugs and he actually saw your movie or your play and he stopped. He, he came to me and said, Dad, I don't want to waste my life anymore. So I cannot thank you enough. And I'm, I'm humbled by that. You know, I'm stunned by that when I hear that. And so it, it means a lot. I know that's why it's been around 30 years. It's, it's a message that clearly needs to be uh, so talked about. The worst thing in life is wasted talent. That's an actual quote from your dad, too. Isn't that was it? my father's quote. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. In fact, they use it all the time, especially, especially in sports analogies. When a great player wastes his life, they say, like in the movie A Bronx Tale, the saddest thing in life, he's wasted his talent. You know? That's got a very personal connection to you, but people know you from other things, Usual Suspects, yeah. Bullets Over Broadway. I mean, you're even doing some Modern Family now. I'm you doing Modern Shorty. Family, yeah, that's right. What else, I mean, other than A Bronx Tale, what else do you look back on right now and go, That's that was a really cool role for me? Or well, that I think Bullets you? Over Broadway, the Academy Award nomination, that was great. I'm working with Woody Allen was really great. Uh, that's that was, But the movies are great, but it's it's my pieces that I wrote for theater Fateful. I wrote this other play that's been done in 18 languages. It, w it became a movie, too, after that. But it, it's, it's my theater things that I write that I'm very, very proud of. I'm very proud of my movies. Uh, analyze this. I've been very fortunate. I've been in some really great films. Yeah. Analyze This and Bullets and Usual Suspects. And I can go on and on. <laughs> so uh, some actors just want to be in one classic. I've been in a bunch of them. Yeah. Do, do you ever get bothered by, uh, I don't want to say a typecasting, but sure. people, th people see you, they think of the Italian mob, Absolutely. the tough guy. Do, yeah. Is there something else that you wish you could have done at some point? Or? Well, you know, I played a lot of roles. I mean, I played different roles, but a lot of the big ones, a lot of the famous ones were a gangster uh, or a cop, like, you know, usual suspects. But um, I always wanted to play a priest, and maybe one day I will. We'll see. <laughs> Jump online here and get some, uh, some questions. Jim in Parma wants to know what it was like and, and the process of you being in Call of Duty. Yeah, that was, you know, Call of Duty was a, a video game. Yeah. A very big video game. And uh, I remember Joe Plantiano, Michael Madsen, Ray Liotta, and myself, uh, they approached us and they said, would you guys do this? And we were like, well, I don't know. Then they said, we're going to pay you this. And we went, all right, well, let's talk about this. Uh, they paid us a great deal. Of, it was really, very lucrative. And I loved doing it because my son at that time was playing those. He said, Dad, everybody knows you. <laughs> I said, well, I got to do Call of Duty for people to know me. Yeah. But it was great because the young audience got the chance to Did see they have me. to do like a, a facial scan or did they yeah, scan? No, they did a facial scan. They put all these things on our faces and movements. It was really interesting. But it was so easy. I mean, it was just only a couple of days' work. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I read somewhere you're a big Seinfeld fan. Oh, yeah. 
Big Seinfeld. What is it about Seinfeld? I'm a big Seinfeld fan too. Oh. I, I quote it all the time. What is it that? Because it's so different. It's it's not about you know talk talk joke. It's about situations. It's about I re yeah I remember that you know being lost in a parking lot and can't find your car. You know waiting in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I just thought it was brilliant. I, I thought. Uh, I just thought it was brilliant. It was so different. Nothing has ever been like it since. I don't know if you could do it again. It was one of those things. It was perfectly written, great cast. It was just everything was just like perfect. Yeah, yeah. it worked. I want to get back to uh, a Bronx Tale real quick. Yeah. You went from the one man show. You're playing 18 roles. Yes. Goes to a movie. Goes back. How hard was it to put music into it? Was that a, a hard well? Uh, look to make it a musical. You know, you go to somebody like Alan Menken. Alan Macon, eight-time Academy Award winner, you know, uh, he did the music. When Glenn Slater, three-time Tony nominee, did the lyrics. So, you have great people around you. You know, I mean, uh, it's still don't get me wrong. Nothing's guaranteed. Right. But we worked together in a room for four years, the three of us, and uh, this is what we got. And we were on Broadway for two years, and now we're we're going. This is the national tour, the Broadway tour. And it's doing incredible, and people love it. When they see it, all they want to do is come and see it again. You know, Alfred Hitchcock used to say, there's only three things you could do to an audience. And if you do two out of three, you got a hit. He says you can make them laugh, you can make them cry, or you could scare them. I think I did all three. And in Bronx Tale, we did all three. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it's a hit. You look back, I mean, you worked with some of the greats. I mean, Pacino, De Niro. Yeah. Who, who sticks out? Who, were you ever starstruck, Jeff? Yes, and the only one I was ever, and, and I loved working with Bob, uh, De Niro, and Al, and Nicholson, great guy, all great guys, but the one who I was always starstruck with, who I was with a lot, and I got to know was Frank Sinatra. Really? And I could never get over who he was. And I'd be at his house, and I'd be on the beach with him in Malibu, and every once in a while I'd be sitting there, just like you and I are right now, and I would just turn my head and go, <laughs> I couldn't get over it. I just couldn't get over it. I, I, I just couldn't. Somebody told me to ask you about an olive story with ah, Frank Sinatra. with Frank Sinatra. Sinatra, yeah. It's a very famous story that, that's in books. I was with Frank Sinatra, and we were, a bunch, were there with a bunch of people, and then finally everybody went inside, and it was just him and I, just like you and I are. And he asked me, he said he loved Bronx Tale. He told me it was his favorite movie. And then he had a martini, and at the end of, the, at the end of our conversation, he said he took the toothpick out with the with the two olives on the martini, uh, on the two pick, and he says, come on, Chad, share my olive. And I said, I didn't know what he meant. He said, share my olive. So I, I, I took the olive off the two pick, and he said, you ready? And I said, yeah. And we popped the olives in our mouth, and he, he said, I love you. You're a great guy. And I said, well, well, thanks, Frank. And he hugged me, and we walked inside, and I was like, what was that about? So I was talking to a bunch of people, and Don Rickles, I, I went over to Don Rickles, and I just told him what happened. And all of a sudden, I hear a voice behind me go, Frank, shed an olive with you. And I turn around, and it's Gregory Peck, the great actor. Yeah. And he said, I said, yeah, what was that about? And he said, that's a Rat Pack tradition, Jazz. When they, all the, Sammy and Dino and all of them, they would drink martinis, and then they would share their olives with each other. It was like a tradition. It was like a, a sign of great friendship. And he says, welcome to the club, Jazz. And I was like, wow. I was stunned by that. I hope I'm not out of line. No. I got a little surprise for you. Sure. I heard the story, and Mr. Palmateri, it would be an honor to share an olive with you as we continue to do this interview. I got some uh, martini olives. Okay. And I got a couple skewers here that we can pick one out as we continue to get a, a couple more questions from the audience. Yes. Wow. That's... Uh that was pretty great. I heard this story last night, and I said, i got to stop and get some olives from Mr. Palm and, uh, Palmateri yeah. today. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> now we're bonded. Friends for life. Friends now. for life. Something else I, I found out I thought was absolutely amazing. Bronx Tale now getting played in uh, high schools, and your daughter, right? Oh, is no, playing? this is like... You know what? Playing the character based on your mind. God has been God has touched me. We gave the rights to one high school just for two weeks because we knew them. We knew the high school. It's uh, Stepanak High School, excuse me, in White Plains. And uh, we gave it to them for two weeks. 
It's an all boys school. So now they have to go out to other schools and audition people. My daughter, Gabriella, gets the part of my mother. So now my daughter is playing my mother in a high school production of a Bronx Tale. My daughter is incredibly talented, I mean, could sing, could dance, could act. And she gets the part. I was like, I couldn't believe it. What is that? I mean, I can't even think about it. I mean, this is words that you pen to paper that yes. you had no idea at the time that down the, down the line your daughter would be reciting. How about stage. this? I wasn't even married when I wrote Bronx Tale. I didn't even have a wife. Who else would have thought that when I wrote it that 30 years from now, my daughter will play my mother in this thing that I'm writing? Bronx Tale is a huge hit in France right now. The one-man show in French. Huge hit. So, and, and I, well, I spoke to the people at Playhouse Square. I'm going to come back here and do the one-man show, the original show that I did. I'm going to come back. That was, I, I was wondering, is it still going? You said it's in France. Is it anywhere in the United States right now? I, I, do, I, I do it. I, I only gave the rights in the United States. I still do it. If somebody goes online, chaspalmentary.net, my schedule. I'm doing it uh, Saturday night, this Saturday. Oh, that's fantastic. In the, at the, uh, the Grand Music Hall in Tarrytown, New York. Yeah. It'd be fascinating. How difficult is that? You're playing 18 different characters. Yeah. I mean, do you have to right brain, left brain that? or? Well, I've been doing it so long now for so many years that I, I, I have to rehearse like, you know, a couple of days in advance. I just, on my treadmill, I, when I'm doing it on the treadmill, I run through the lines. And I'm ready to go. <laughs> want to jump back here online and see what other sort of questions we may be getting in. Uh, Bo asked, how fun was it making the bar scene in A Bronx Tale where you beat up the bikers? <laughs> Well, that was fun because that was a real life event that happened, and uh, we had real actually we had real uh, bikers in that scene, uh, and they were great. They were really wonderful, and uh, I enjoyed doing that because it brought back a lot of memories. <laughs> uh, Nicholas asked, "What are the two things you've learned about yourself as you've built your career?" I learned that the saddest thing in life is wasted talent, yeah. and uh, the choices you make shape your life forever. Just the lines that I wrote in the Bronx Tale. Those are the things I learned. That every time you make a choice, whether it's you know good or bad, it will dictate the rest of your life. Every time. Every choice you make has repercussions to it. So be wary of your choices. Uh, this coming in from Sherry. Ask what your favorite genre is. I would say theater. Yeah? Yeah. So... It's been the one-man show, it's been the movie, it's back as a musical. I think what left is maybe a series. Do you see that maybe coming down the line? I don't know about a series. I think maybe in time and years from now they'll make a movie of the musical. Yeah. I think that, yeah. I want to jump back here online. Um, somebody's chiming in, wanted to know, uh, what do you think your dad would think right now, going back to, uh, you know, Lorenzo? Yeah, well, my dad lived, my dad died at 91, and he only died some years ago, so he saw all my success. He didn't, never saw the musical, and my mom died uh, just two years ago. She was 97, so they saw all my success. Again, she didn't see the musical, but they saw everything, and I, I'm, they, I know they were very, very proud, very proud, yes. This, uh, this show is built a lot on, uh, in a time period, I think a lot of people that, that lived through it and, and went through it with you, a time of racial tension. There yeah. was a girl in there named Jane. Yeah. Do you ever talk to her? Do you ever reach out to her ne again? I never, don't know what ever happened to her. People always ask me that question and I say, I wish I had an answer. You would think that she would have came to see me in a play, a show in New York, a movie, something. You know what? She's my age. I don't know. Maybe, maybe something happened. Maybe she passed away. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. How hard is it to, to watch that every night? I mean, or how, I guess, gratifying is it to know that you got out of that car? Well... Like, what does that do to you as a, as a kid? Well, think about that. If, if, if I stay in that car, I'm not here right now. Right. I'm not here. We're not talking. Bronx deal never happens. I'm gone. That's how delicate life is. And that's what I, when I teach, when I speak to young kids, I tell them, the choices you make, a stupid choice like that, your life's over. So I'm blessed to be here. God has put me here. I thank God every day. Um, and then also, the, I mean, another big thing in that that everybody talks about is the, the test. Right, the door Unlocking test. the, the right. car door. How often do you get uh, reference to that now? 
Oh my God, every day. People come over to me, they go, Chaz, this is my wife, she passed the door test. This is my wife, Chaz, my wife passed the door test. I get this every day. I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you a quick anecdote. I was dating my wife now. Yeah. And uh, of course now we have the automatic locks on the car. Yes. But we were in a restaurant and my wine glass was maybe down about here and I yeah. had to go to the restroom. And when I came back, she ordered me another wine and I just had a big smile on my face. Right. And she said, what's going on? I said, oh, nothing. You know, I can't see you. And she, did you just Bronx tail me? Uh, that's, I said, yeah. no, but if I did, you would have passed it. That's it. See, even though they have the automatic door lock, that doesn't matter. If she gets in the car, when you open the door, if she gets in the car, she has to click it a few times and just make it go up and down. Just to t as a gesture, I'm opening the door for you. Yeah. So it's okay. It doesn't matter if it's automatic. So uh, you, you talked about you're still doing uh, the the, uh, the one man show. That's you're right. still doing some stuff on Modern Family. What's next for you down the line? Give me five years down the road. Are you looking at anything? Yeah. Well, I've written two other plays. Uh, one play, one straight play, one one musical that I'm writing now, and uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, I'm in a TV series right now. It's called Godfather of Harlem with Forrest Whitaker. That comes out in October on Epics, and it's a great series uh, about the '60s. Uh, with me, Forrest Whitaker, Paul Savino, and uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. So uh, we'll see what happens. Chess, I appreciate you eating and all with me today. Thank you uh, so much, Chess Palmateri. We thank you, and we thank you for being a part of Let's Be Clear. Great job. All right. Good. Stuff.